Now that the constabularies see themselves as movie stars with their onboard cameras and their videos, a simple Ford is no longer good enough. That's where this comes in, the Lotus Esprit police car. But don't worry, it's only a concept, and it's here at the Motor Show, just like us. Welcome to the Motor Show, this year's annual automotive orgy. Over 700,000 pairs of feet will tramp through this hall. £150 million has been spent. Jeremy, what are you doing? There's a monster. Where? There's a monster here. Jeremy, this is the NEC, not Loch Ness. It's a scary dragon with big spiky teeth. Come on, show me. Get off! <laughs> Now look, that is a monster. Ah, oh, yes, I'd rather see what you mean. And never mind, um, it won't bite. Right, in pretty bunny time. It may look like something out of Jurassic Park, but this, in fact, is the new Ford Scorpio. Ford's not very convincing answer to the new Vauxhall Omega. There are going to be some bravery awards handed out on this one, though. I mean, someone somewhere walked into a Ford board meeting and said, this is it. This is what we've come up with. And one of those directors turned right back round again and said, well done, Stevie, well done, Ray. That's exactly it. That is what the people want. It's a bit unusual. I think it'll take some getting used to. I don't like it at all. I wouldn't buy it if you gave it to me. That new rounded shape on the front end, uh, a lot's OK. I prefer the older shape, I think. Yeah. I suppose it's a shape that will grow on you. It's right up to the minute and shows real class. It, it's one of those cars where you either do or you don't. And I don't know whether I do or not. The changes on the inside are rather more successful. There's the same amount of space as before, which is particularly good news for those in the back. But the dash is radically different and pretty good. Prices aren't bad either. £16,000 for the entry-level two-litre saloon, rising to £27,000 for the top-of-the-range estate. There's no hatchback anymore. But then there isn't much street cred either. Well, Ford's designers may have committed a styling sin, but their rival General Motors have come up with a, um, little honey. The pretty 1.4 Tigra comes onto the market at just under £11,000. And with the hot hatch market being ravaged by high insurance premiums, Vauxhall have been quite bold in producing it. It's a very curvaceous car, and like most models, does have a best side. Catching the light, it's a stunner. The Tigra is ideal for those amongst us who are looking for a bit of style and groan at the sight of yet another Euro hatchback. Inside, well, it's not as stylish as the outside, but it's pretty functional and the seats are quite comfortable. Although there's not an awful lot of room for people of Jeremy S. proportions. And the back seats can really only be meant for the vertically challenged or children. The innovative rear wraparound sun dim window is not just tinted, it'll stop your passengers roasting in hot weather. This 1.4 is likely to be in insurance group 8, and there's a 1.6 which falls into group 12, but you don't get an awful lot more for your money. I'd stick with a 1.4 and invest in a smart pair of wheels and a passenger airbag. As with the Calibra, Vauxhall have found Ford napping. The Tigra's competitors in the small coupe market managed to sell about 4,000 between them. Vauxhall aims to gobble all that up. The car's on sale on November the 18th, and we think it's going to take the market by storm. It was only last year that the Tigra was a concept car. Others might take a little longer to hit the streets, especially the wackier ones, which all seem to be French. And here is Citroen's family car of the future, the Xanai. No plans to put it into production at the moment, but its roll-limiting suspension will be appearing on their new Xantia Activa. Citroen's partners at Peugeot have come up with this, the Eon. 
It's their idea of a town car for the next century. It's powered by batteries. It has a range of 93 miles. It could well be the next 106, which would be a shame. Renault have come up with a whole fleet of concept Civic shuttles powered by liquid petroleum gas. This is the Ludo. Bright, cheeky and matey, it's firmly aimed at the leisure market. And with no central pillar, there'll be no problems accommodating those Derriger skis, mountain bike or windsurfer. And it'll do 92 miles an hour. So what are we looking at here, people? Your glimpse into the future, the XR3i of the 21st century. Now, you won't be seeing these French fancies for a wee while yet, but the Germans, on the other hand, might reveal theirs sooner than you think. This is the Mercedes Vision A, a concept car destined for either electrical or conventional power plants that's been touring the world's motor shows for the past year, while the company's market researchers keep an eagle eye on people's reactions to it. Why? Well, because unlike many other concept cars we see at the shows, this one goes into production in two and a half years' time to become a Mercedes for the masses. And that poses some big questions, both for Mercedes and the rest of the motor industry. Up to now, Mercedes have been known as manufacturers of heavy, beautifully engineered and expensive cars. But recession has showed the company that the road's survival is not paved with big, thirsty cars. They plan to build 200,000 of these a year when they go into production. So if they build a baby hatchback like this to the same quality as their traditional big cars, will people buy it? Well, so far, the answer from the market researchers seems to be an emphatic yes. And that's bad news for other small car manufacturers. The production version won't be quite the same as this uh, concept car. It'll be slightly longer and smoother, about 3.6 metres overall, they think. And the aluminium body of the prototype will be switched to steel. But the design principles will remain the same. And some of those are very clever indeed. Now, the first thing to say, this is a double-decker car. The engine, transmission, suspension, fuel tank and exhaust are entirely self-contained under the first deck. And above them is a second floor, strengthened for side impact, and it's on that floor that the occupants sit. Now, that means you sit pretty high off the floor, but it also means the maximum possible space is available for four Mercedes-sized passengers and their luggage. And it's going to be very safe in a crash as well. The engine and transmission will slide under this floor rather than into the passenger compartment. This is an electric version of the car being developed for the Californian market where the legislators are demanding zero emission vehicles by the year 2003. It's powered by a 54 brake horsepower motor and a high temperature sodium nickel battery pack. Mercedes claim a range of 95 miles for it. Now I have to confess I'm a bit of a skeptic about electric cars. The much heralded revolution in battery design simply hasn't arrived. Nevertheless, you can't fail to be impressed by the eerie way this thing just glides away. I'm sure we're going to have a major problem with uh, hitting pedestrians who can't hear it coming though. Production A cars will have proper engines, so we'll have to wait for them to make any meaningful comments on performance, ride and handling. But already there's little doubt that Mercedes have an impressive super mini contender on their hands. And here's another small German car with a difference, BMW's new 3 Series Compact. Now at just 13,350, that's 90 quid less than a Volkswagen GTI, this one's going to sell like the elixir of youth. Available as a 1.6 and 1.8, I have to ask, what will it do for BMW's highly polished image? Just think of all those suburban mummies doing the private school run. Will the kudos of the blue propeller survive the friction of popular taste? There are those that say that because it's cheap, it won't be a proper BMW, but from where I'm sitting, it looks and feels every inch the part. Plus, you get standard ABS and driver's airbag, and don't forget those all-important second-hand values. A thoroughly sensible little car. Of course, there's Quentin's idea of a sensible car 
and there's my idea of a sensible car, and this, to me, is perfectly sensible. The Dodge Viper now has air conditioning for those hot summer days and a hard top for those cold winter evenings. What do you want? This car is about as sensible as a horde of Mongol stormtroopers on a three-day pass. You have no soul. This is the perfect family runaround. You, I'm sure, would prefer an MPV. Very droll. When it arrived at the start of the 80s, the Renault Espace seemed more like a work of art than a way of getting to Sainsbury's. With a nose like an Intercity 125, huge square windows, a lofty driving position, and trendy swivelling seats, it revolutionised car travel as we knew it. And the one-box shape wasn't just a gimmick. How else could you carry four adults in total comfort, or three children and enough clobber for a summer holiday? Ten years and two facelifts down the road, and the Espace still accounts for nearly half of all the people carriers sold. Now, that may not sound impressive, but in car terms, well, it's as close as you get to Monopoly, but not for long. There's a new kid on the block, and it's after blood. Renault's blood. Now this almost bland looking vampire goes by the name of the Citroen Evasion in France, although we still don't know what it's going to be called when it arrives here. But with different lights, it'll be sold as the Peugeot 806, the Lancia Zeta and the Fiat Ulysse. Confused? Well, don't be. To save a bit of money on development, the French and the Italians have clubbed together to design the definitive Espace Buster. All except the launcher will be in right-hand drive form next year, so should Renault be quaking in its corporate boots? Well, from the driver's seat, the answer has to be yes. Because the makers desperately want to court car drivers, they've made it as user-friendly as a Metro and as much fun to hurl around as a GTI. Steering is sharp and, well, pretty sporty. There's no lurching around corners either. No mean feat for a car that can take up to eight people. The pedals are better positioned than in the Espace, and the gear levers on the dashboard rather than on the floor, which is a lot more convenient. I'd still prefer an automatic, but that's to come much later. Pressing on, the Evasion is fairly nippy, although the standard two-litre engine is far less desirable than the turbo version we're testing. Either way, cruising isn't particularly economical, but it's very comfortable. It's so relaxing that I can imagine dozing off on a hot day with the heat streaming through the windows. Luckily, air conditioning is standard on most models, so, like your sandwiches, you stay fresh. Inside, it's good news, too, with lots of nice little touches. Like, for example, the gliding ashtray cover. Nifty. And a little pocket to put your sunglasses in. And there are remote control switches for the radio on the steering wheel, although, of course, the Espace had those first. The oddly placed handbrake does take a bit of getting used to, but overall, well, it's a big improvement on the Espace, although the party starts back there. Well, there's slightly more room than in the Espace, and the seats are larger and more comfy. And if you're a bit stronger than me, well, you can put them in all sorts of different combinations. Well, even if you don't have seven little darlings, don't worry. Apparently, only a small percentage of MPV drivers ever take more than two passengers. But people carrying isn't a cheap hobby. Prices start at 17,000, rising to 26,000 for the deluxe version with goodies like electric seats. We don't know the UK specs yet, but it looks like airbags, twin sunroofs, and extra seats will cost more. So, has the old favourite, the Espace, been outclassed? Well, yes, it has. But if you must have a new people carry before next year, well, it still does a top-class job. Or you could wait till 96, when the all-new Espace comes out. But by then, the W, Honda, Ford and Mercedes will all have launched their MPVs too. So, there's no escape. The men in white coats reckon the MPV will be the shape of the 21st century. And you, me, and everyone else will be driving one. Unless, that is, the Koreans have their way. They arrived in Britain in 1983 and, unburdened by any import restrictions, they've been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now they're going to get bigger still because there's a new Korean car company, Daewoo. They've two models to tempt us with. 
First of all, the Espero, which is basically an old Cavalier with a body that's been styled in Italy. And then there's the Nexia, which is basically an old Astra with a body that looks like an old Astra. Both these cars give credence to the argument that Korean cars, generally speaking, are somewhat cheaper and rather better equipped than their European and Japanese competitors, but that in terms of refinement, they're a few years behind. That image is something Hyundai is hoping to change with its new £7,500 accent. It was designed in Korea, it's built in Korea, it uses entirely Korean components. Funny, isn't it, how they're building their car industry up while we're winding ours down, which is one of the reasons we'll be going over to Korea later in the series to see what's what. Right, enough of all this glitz and glamour. Let's get down to earth a bit. Last week on Top Gear, we launched our second car customer satisfaction survey. We asked you what you think of your K-plate cars. Were they reliable? How did you get on with the dealers? Were you disappointed at all? And what was the warranty like? We asked you to phone us and the response has been awesome, but there are still some gaps. An important part of the survey is to get a good cross-section of models, not just the popular ones. So, if you drive any of the following on a K-plate, ring us on 0800 44 774 and sit back, scan the list and we'll take you on a tour of the show. cars with Porsche, who have been shifting yet more of their racetrack technology onto the road. Michael Schumacher working furiously at the wheel and his brain working furiously inside that helmet. What Michael Schumacher does most Sunday afternoons, you can now do along the high street anytime you like. Not win a Grand Prix, but change gear with your fingertips. Porsche has applied the latest race-inspired technology to its 30-year-old 911. The result is Tiptronic S, the automatic transmission that lets your fingers do the walking. Tiptronic S gives you three ways of changing gear. With the conventional automatic shift pattern, and with this separate gate where you push the lever forward to change up, and pull it back to change down. The up and down functions are also duplicated on these steering wheel buttons. Useful for those people who come over all fingers and thumbs at the thought of driving a 911 Carrera. With terrific power and wonderful poise, the 1995 model, unlike its predecessors, doesn't fling you backwards through the hedge at every other corner. Tiptronic S is also cleverer than the average XR2 driver. It won't let you change down a couple of gears when travelling at warp speed. Purists will tell you that a 911 shouldn't have an automatic transmission that a 911 should be about driving as a hands-on experience. Purists are, of course, sad, boring people. All that's wrong with Tiptronic S is that it's got four speeds. The manual car has got six gears to play with. So you can play fewer tunes in the Tiptronic S 911, which is a shame. Porsche also claims that Tiptronic S is a valuable safety feature, as you can keep your hands on the wheel at all times. Perhaps. The truth is that even when you're pootling down to the shops, Tiptronic S makes you feel just like Michael Schumacher, and that's very cool indeed. I'll tell you something about the real Michael Schumacher. He's tiny and he's German, which means he's got quite a lot in common with the new Volkswagen Polo. Now, this is going to compete in the most ferocious part of the market. It needs good looks, and it's got them. In many ways, it's not dissimilar to the Seat Ibiza. They have the same floor pens too. Some of the engines are the same. The dash is the same. The switch gear is the same. But of course, this isn't surprising because Volkswagen owns Seat. What is surprising is that they're priced about the same. It rather looks then like Volkswagen is competing with itself. But never mind all that, what about the car itself? 
Well, if you're coming to it from an old polo, it's pretty good. It's smaller on the outside, but there's more head and elbow room on the inside. You pay about £7,000 for a 1 litre, rising to £12,000 for a 1.6. There's even going to be a diesel. Right now, there's a five-door. Volkswagen, then, has thought of everything. Except the Seat Ibiza. How would you like to see the motor show in real style? Stay in a five-star hotel, be chauffeur-driven in a Jaguar XJR, and meet us on Family Day, Sunday, October the 30th. This year, the Mini is celebrating its 35th birthday, so we want you to tell us how much the Morris Mini cost when it was launched in 1959. Get it right and you could be our lucky winner. As a clue, the average weekly wage was £13.49. Beer cost sixpence a pint, and an Aston Martin DB4 was a trifling four grand. So how much did the Mini cost? Was it A, £496, B, £578, or C, £695. Call us on 0891 339966 and we'll be showing you that number again later on. Doubtless you'd expect me to say the Aston Martin DB7 is the best car at the show, but I don't know because I haven't driven it yet. I do know this though, it'll have to be going some to be better than the car Tiff has been driving. Ferrari is a name that conjures up dreams in everyone's mind. To me, they're bright red Grand Prix cars winning world championships. To Jeremy, they're seductive beauties to catch the eye of the opposite sex. But for the very fortunate few, they're cars to be owned, cars to be driven. Now, although you're not going to believe it, I have never driven a road-going Ferrari before, but today, that's going to change. Meet the new 355, my Ferrari for the day. Before you even get into the 355, you fall in love with its clean, uncluttered lines. It's gorgeous. On the inside, there's Ferrari's prancing horse logo on the steering wheel and this tactile chrome gear knob, while in the back, there's an engine just waiting to go. First impressions behind the wheel confirm the racing heritage of Ferrari. The beauty of the stark simplicity of the instrument layout that's enhanced by this two-tone interior. The power-assisted brakes and steering are very light. This is not a supercar that needs super muscles. The driving position is traditionally Italian. If you've got long arms and short legs, you'll be fine. If you haven't, you'll just have to grin and bear it. Slotting through the six-speed gearbox is a real delight, and the engine makes a wonderful sound effect. Glorious, especially at the 8,500 RPM rev limit. The sad thing is that you can only reach it in first gear, because in second, you'd be doing an illegal 80 miles an hour. Into town for a quick road test of, well, the image. Time for a coffee, Italian, of course, and time to admire the scenery. While the scenery admires the Ferrari. Clarkson does have a point. <clears throat> anyway, there's enough room in the front for an overnight bag and a little light shopping. While in the back, the Ferrari engineers prove that beauty isn't just skin deep. Five valves per cylinder, plus a myriad of other developments, including lightweight pistons and titanium conrods that have pushed the power output up to 380 horsepower. Enough of this posing. Let's go and use some of that power. You get a shiver in the park, it's raining in the park, but meantime, sound of the river, you're stopping your whole everything. 
winding through these country lanes, you can constantly marvel at the poise and balance of the 355. Even at these moderate speeds, the Ferrari is a real driver's car, providing all that feedback and satisfaction that you wish for. It's fitted with electronically controlled dampers that constantly vary their stiffness as the attitude of the car is monitored. And there's comfort and sport modes. But that's not the only help the handling's had. Ferrari have added a bit of Grand Prix-style ground effect. The underneath of the car has been covered with this smooth, flat bottom which feeds the air to the rear, where it's divided into these two channels. Now, these accelerate the airflow out of the back of the car, which creates a negative air pressure that sucks the car into the ground. All this wonderful state-of-the-art technology is what's impressed me most about my first day in a Ferrari. It's a mechanical masterpiece, a Leonardo da Vinci on wheels. Ciao. You didn't think I wasn't going to, did you? A Ferrari for the day, and it's just got to go on the track. It's only here that you can really appreciate all the benefits of that wonderful Italian artistry. Only now can I use eight and a half thousand revs in all the gears, keeping those 40 valves all dancing and singing in perfect harmony. Now I can push the car to its limit and seek out any nasty vices that might catch a driver unawares. But certainly, so far, the 355 doesn't seem to have any. It just handles beautifully. Down the straight, you're up to nearly 130 miles an hour in fifth, braking over this undulating section. Tricky for the car to keep its poise. Turn in third gear, add some power. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, very nice. After my day's extensive research, there's no doubt in my mind that the 355 is going to become one of the classic Ferraris. And at just £83,000, it's a snip by Ferrari standards. Before we go, let me introduce you to the Top Gear stand. It's here that you'll find the only Ferrari at the show. It's here also that you'll find Quentin and myself. One more thing, though. One day, I'm definitely going to own one of those Ferrari 355s. There is a flaw in your argument, Jeremy. Actually, mate, there are several flaws in my argument. Which one are you referring to? You work for the BBC. Yep. I mean, Quentin, would you just look at what they've booked us here? It's no more than you deserve. I'm going to do a handbrake turn, mate. Ooh. Please don't. So, those numbers again for our K-Reg car survey call 0800 447774. And for our motor show competition, it's 0891 3399966. If you want more motor show, we'll be back on Sunday with a 50-minute special. If you want more cars, the Citroen DS is the star of this Sunday's The Cars the Star. And if that still isn't enough, there's perpetual motion on the Ford Transit tomorrow.